In this screencast, we're going to talk about how to calculate shunt fraction, or QPQS. Now, Dr. DeFridis went over this in class, uh, but some students in the, in the past couple of years have always asked uh, for a little bit more detail on how that calculation occurs, because it doesn't quite make sense in its sort of final shortcut clinical form, uh, which is really all you're going to be responsible for. And so we'll just start with that. And um, what we see here is QPQS, or the flow through the pulmonary circuit, as um, expressed as a ratio to the flow through the systemic circuit, is really equal to the systemic aortic saturation um, minus the systemic uh, vena cava saturation over the saturation in the pulmonary vein uh, minus the saturation in the pulmonary artery. And Dr. DeFridis mentioned that basically the highest saturations always go in front, and the terms that are related to QP go in the denominator even though the QP is in the numerator. And what we're going to do in this video is really see how this simplified and pretty short equation develops from the full equations. And so in order to understand how to calculate shunt fraction, first you have to learn how to calculate cardiac output using the FIC principle. And I think you might have had some of this material last year. Then we're going to see how combining QP and QS together gives you the simplified equation. And what we're going to do is kind of unravel the cardiac circulation. So here we have sort of a little train track. And this is sort of an homage to um, a picture drawn in Grossman's uh, cardiac catheterization. So you have the body, blood returns to the vena cava, then the right atrium, the right ventricle, the pulmonary artery, and then to the lungs it picks up oxygen, and then the pulmonary vein, the left atrium, left ventricle, the aorta, and back out to the body. So that's the cardiac circuit, the normal cardiac circuit. And what we're going to do is we're going to put a train on this circuit. So this train has got a couple of hemoglobins in it. Each hemoglobin uh, is, is represented here by sort of a, a hopper or a boxcar. And it's got some boxes in here to represent uh, how much oxygen each hemoglobin uh, is carrying. So the boxes can get up to four high. So we're going to say this is sort of like a hemoglobin saturation of 75%. So that's pretty similar to what the venous circulation is, which is where the train is on the track. It's in the venous uh, side, sort of the, it's just come back from the body. It's in the vena cava, right atrium, right ventricle, in the pulmonary artery, and it's ready to get out to the lungs to get oxygenated. So this is venous blood. Now when the train comes around to the lungs, uh, this hopper sort of, fills these um, cars with boxes. So it takes the, the blood that was previously 75% saturated and it tops it off and now it's 100% saturated, depicted by the, the stack of boxes being four high as opposed to three high. So now the blood is fully oxygenated. Each hemoglobin is 100% saturated um, now that it's full of oxygen. So now the train is in the arterial circulation, and it's 100% uh, saturated, uh, denoted by the boxes being four high. And now the train is about to get to the body, where the body is demanding oxygen. And shown here is sort of a balance. And on the left side of this balance is the total body oxygen demand. And what the train has to do is drop off enough little boxes to make up enough uh, supply to meet the body's total demand. So the train is in the middle of dropping off these boxes, and you can see them coming through the hopper here. But one circuit is complete now. This train is still in the venous blood, but it's only met sort of half the demand of the body. Only the, the body is only sort of half satisfied. It's only gotten half of its oxygen. So what the train has to do is make another circuit, and now it's made two circuits, and it's dropped off sufficient boxes. So now let's look at that a little bit more mathematically. On the left here, we have the boxes that were demanded. It's on the left side of the balance. And on the right here, we have the boxes that were delivered, which is on the right side of the balance. And you can see that these equal. So we demanded 50 boxes a minute. And the way we got to 50 was each car delivered five boxes. And there are five cars per train. So that comes out to 25. So each train load delivered 50 boxes. And so what that works out to mean is that we needed two trains per minute in order to come up with a demand of boxes of 50 boxes a minute. So now what we need to do in order to sort of more fully develop the FIC equation is 
is rearrange these terms and pull out some terms. So here's sort of the first step of that. Instead of saying boxes delivered per car, what we could say is what was the difference between the number of boxes when the car was full and when the car was unloaded. So for example, each car when it was full carried 20 boxes and when it was unloaded it had 15 boxes. So that difference is five uh, boxes which comes out to the same term as up here and again we can multiply through by the number of cars per train and then figure out how many trains per minute we need in order to meet the uh, box demand of the, of the, the systemic uh, part of the body. So we've got to pull out one more term now and that's called capacity per car. And the way we figure this out is basically all we're saying is that instead of saying uh, there are 20 boxes when the car is full, we're going to say the capacity per car is 20 and when the car was full it was at 100% capacity. So that multiplies out to the same number of 20. And similarly, instead of saying there were 15 boxes when the car was unloaded, what we're going to say is that the car has a capacity of 20 and it was at 75% capacity when it was unloaded to give you the same number of 15 here. So all we're doing here is just expressing how many boxes there are when the car is either full or unloaded as a percentage of its capacity when it's full and we know what the capacity per car is. So now all we do is we pull out capacity per car out of the parentheses and we lump, bring it out here alongside cars per train and trains per minute and we get the final equation which is exactly analogous as we'll see in the next slide to the Fick equation that is to say boxes demanded per minute is the same as the difference between the capacity when the car is full and when it's unloaded times the capacity per car times the number of cars per train times the number of trains per minute. So enough about trains and let's see how this uh, correlates exactly to oxygen uh, demand. So instead of boxes demanded per minute, really what we're talking about is systemic oxygen demand per minute. And then instead of percentage of capacity when we're full, for example, we're talking about the percentage of oxygen saturation in the aorta. Uh, we're talking about the percentage oxygen sa saturation in the vena cava instead of percentage capacity when unloaded. Capacity per car is exactly like milliliters of oxygen per gram of hemoglobin. Cars per train is exactly like grams of hemoglobin per deciliter of blood. And trains per minute is exactly like deciliters of blood per minute. Of course, we express cardiac output in the end in liters per minute, so there's a couple fudge factors in here. And so, uh, so that's the fudge factor here. And these are some real numbers uh, to go alongside it. And what we're not showing is dissolved oxygen content, which is really only important when people are on, for example, 100% oxygen. So this liters per blood per minute is cardiac output. And so all we need to do in order to define cardiac output with the FIC principle for any given patient is know what their hemoglobin concentration is and know what the oxygen saturation in the aorta and the vena cava are and actually physically measure the oxygen demanded per minute by using something called a metabolic cart where we actually measure how much oxygen is used up by the patient's breathing. So that's the FIC, FIC equation. And if there's no shunt, we're going to look at our railroad track a little bit more, it shouldn't matter where you measure the oxygen saturation difference. So you could either measure the difference uh, in saturation between the pulmonary artery and the pulmonary vein, so you can measure how much oxygen gets picked up in the lungs, or you could equivalently measure how much oxygen sort of gets dropped off in the body by measuring the oxygen saturation in the aorta and the vena cava. If there's no shunt, it doesn't matter. Those, these, those two methods of measurement should be exactly equivalent. So now, what if there is a shunt? Well, then it does matter. And what we're going to do here is sort of introduce these two little guys, uh, Inspector QP, looking at the pulmon pulmonic sort of uh, changes in oxygen saturation, and Inspector QS looking at the uh, oxygen saturation changes in the body. And so you can see here, all I've done is take that same equation and figure out what, um, instead of flow, we're just going to talk about systemic flow uh, or pulmonary flow. And we're going to put in the respective oxygen um, saturation difference that we're talking about. So for systemic flow, we're talking about the difference between saturation in the aorta and the vena cava. For pulmonic flow, we're looking at the saturation difference between the pulmonary vein and the pulmonary artery. 
But these two inspector guys are a little bit lazy, and so what they, they don't really actually care about what QS is or what QP is actually. All they really care about is the ratio. Who's got more oxygen flying around uh, than who? Uh, they just really are interested in sort of comparing to each other. So if you do that, and you know that the oxygen demanded per minute is equivalent to the oxygen delivered per minute, that holds true whether or not you have a shunt. The amount of body, oxygen the body needs is by definition the amount of oxygen the body gets. Um, if those two numbers are not matching up, that's incompatible with life. So these two sides are equal to each other. So they set them equal to each other, then they do a little math, and they cross out the terms that are in common. So now we have a much more simplified equation. And all I've done here is take this and redraw it on one line. And if you divide through by putting the QS, dividing it back into the left side of the equation, and then taking this uh, pulmonary venous and pulmonary artery saturation term and putting it on the right side of the equation, we get the final form uh, that was discussed in class of the uh, QPQS equation. So let's look kind of graphically at what that means in terms of a left to right shunt and then we'll look at a right to le left shunt. So here's a left to right shunt. And so here we've just drawn a shunt at the level of the left ventricle um, going to the right atrium. Now, of course, anatomically, that's pretty hard to do, um, but that's just sort of how the track lays out. So um, we can see here we've got a track, and we can see also some of the blood goes uh, not shunted through to the body. And we can see also in the lungs, since there's some, uh, there's some circulation going through this track, and some circulation going through this track, the thickness of the track going through the lungs is thicker than either the shunt or the systemic track. Let's put some train cars on the track. And what we see is that, uh, for example, this hopper, which is um, partially filled, transits through the lungs, gets completely filled, now it has the option of either going to the body and going from an oxygen saturation of, say, 100% to 75%, we're getting shunted and going right back to the right ventricle. And so when these two hoppers mix, you get one hopper that's 75% full. You get one hopper that is 100% full, and that mixes out to be a hopper that's, let's say, 83% full. So you can see that the, um, the oxygen concentration in the pulmonary artery is going to be about 83% because of that mixing. The pulmonary vein oxygen concentration is about 100%, so that difference is going to be... 17%. But the systemic difference, and this is the really important part, is still about the same. It is um, 25%. So you can see that in the equation, uh, we know that the pulmonary uh, shunt fraction, or rather the QPQS, is greater than 1 because there's more flow through the QP than the QS. So um, it makes sense that the 17% ends up on the bottom of the equation and the 25% ends up on the top of the equation. Similar thing happens with right to left shunt. So a right to left shunt here, we've drawn a shunt going from the right ventricle to the left atrium. And again, thicker train track through the systemic circulation, thinner train track through the shunt and the lungs. And we're going to put some trains again on these tracks. And so what we see here again is uh, a fully saturated uh, hopper of hemoglobin coming out of the lungs. And what we see here is a 75% saturated hopper of hemoglobin coming out of the body after the body has uh, gotten its hemoglobin. And we can see that this 75% this hopper can either, either go back to the lungs to get reoxygenated, or it could travel through the shunt and go right back to the body. And when it does that, it mixes with the fully oxygenated blood uh, in the pulmonary vein. Uh, and so now you have a ox systemic uh, aortic oxygen saturation of about 83% instead of the normal 100%. And again, if you do the math, uh, you'll see that it makes sense because it works out to making a QPQS, which is less than one, which is indicative of higher systemic flow than pulmonary flow, which is indicative of a right to left shunt. So we've seen in this video um, how to calculate QPQS and how it works out to be the uh, final form that's this relatively simple equation that you can carry around in your head, but it is a little bit confusing why the pulmonary saturations end up at the bottom of the, of the uh, equation than, than on the top. Thanks very much.